You've been quiet today. You okay? No, I'm freezing. I guess I could turn the heat up, but it's gotten really expensive. Psh, no way we're paying for that. What are you wearing? No wonder you're freezing. We gotta get you properly dressed. Here. What? <laughs> I live in California, and I freely admit I moved here to get away from winter. And while I have never had to shovel snow or slip on ice in the Bay Area, it does still get damp and chilly, and it does still help to dress for the weather. Hi, I'm V, fashion historian who gets cold really easily, and today we are here to talk about my three favorite historical ways to winterize my wardrobe. Dressing for the weather was always important because back in the day, we didn't have things like central heating or modern insulation. Buildings had to be heated with fire in various forms, which presents its own set of problems. And believe it or not, heating fuel could be even more expensive than it is today. And if you've never lived in an old house, you know how drafty and badly sealed the windows are. Dressing warmly was one of the most effective ways to get through the cold weather. And we've lost a few of the tricks of it to time. It doesn't get truly bitterly cold in the Bay Area, but the fact that it's always a damp chill means that it can feel a lot colder than it is, even inside. And a lot of buildings here, being California, have only nominal heating or insulation. Mine isn't too bad, but I still need to make some adjustments, like putting warmer sheets on my bed. So thanks a ton to this video's sponsor, Brooklinen, for giving me some truly beautiful options. Brooklinen makes high quality luxury sheets and homes textiles that are as gorgeous as they are comfortable. I have some standards for fabrics, as many dressmakers do, and Brooklinen does not disappoint. Their sheets are amazing quality, long lasting, and get softer with every wash. They do seasonal color collections that can sell out really fast, so I'm super lucky I got the colors I wanted. I went for the Lux Hardcore Bundle, which gets you a sheet set, duvet cover, and extra pillowcases for 20% less than buying the same things individually. You can mix and match over 20 colors, patterns, and sizes too, to fit whatever your preferences are. Linen sheets are my go-to, but cotton is a surprising amount warmer than linen, and the Lux Sateen fabric is cozy without being too heavy. These sheets have a 480 thread count, the cotton is Okeotex certified for safety, and they've got a soft luminous sheen that looks and feels fancy without being extra work. I thought I'd never find cotton sheets good enough after sleeping in linen, and Brooklinens are pretty much the only exception. Winter is not my favorite season, and I struggle with the lighting being gray, so I've been looking for ways to keep my space feeling light and bright without being colorless. This seasonal collection is full of pastels that are cheerful while still being sophisticated, so I combined a sheet set in willow with a duvet cover and extra pillowcases in beach grass. I've been warm and cozy while I sleep without feeling smothered, and my bedroom feels bright and spacious even while it's gray out. Brooklinen is offering my viewers a special discount of $20 off any order over hundred. Just click the link below and use code SNAPPYDRAGON20. Are you gonna talk about winterizing your pajamas now too? No, the whole point of warmer sheets is that I don't need different pajamas. Darn, I thought you might show us the new ones you made. I posing on the internet in my night clothes. Wouldn't be the sauciest thing you've done. Stop it. Hey, you're forgetting. I know what your next video is about. Go take a nap. So what I said about cotton being warmer than linen, different fibers and materials have different qualities that can make them good for different purposes. Linen is great for hot weather because of how breathable it is. Cotton is a little warmer because of the texture of the fibers. You know what can keep you really warm? Wool. I think modern people get a bit nervous about wool because we are told so often, you can't wash it, or it'll shrink if you look at it wrong, or it's itchy. And while I do not advise putting just any wool item in the washing machine as if it's cotton, some of the same qualities that make wool clothes need different care also make them perfect for cold weather. Wool fibers grow on the sheep with something called crimp the curl and fluffiness and texture of each individual wool fiber. This texture makes it grip better when it's spun into yarn for textiles, and it also traps air between the fires, which gives great insulation. Smaller, thinner individual wool fibers have tighter crimp, and this allows for them to be processed into cloth in different ways. For instance, merino wool is especially desirable for soft, fine textured fabrics and garments. Wool fibers also have microscopic barbs on their surface, which grip onto each other as they're spun or processed. This is part of what allows wool to felt up, 
That thing we're always afraid washing it will do. But if you felt wool cloth on purpose, you can get a material that's denser, thicker, and fluffier, all of which make it warmer. Wool is naturally water resistant in two ways. The outside of the fiber is hydrophobic, meaning water repellent, and any amount of natural lanolin, sheep grease, that stays in the processed wool or that the wool is treated with after helps repel water too. Wool also has something called thermal resistance, meaning it doesn't transmit heat or cold through itself, but explaining that in more detail would require me to know anything at all about thermodynamics, which I don't. If you do know about thermodynamics, please do tell us all the scientific goodness down in the comments. And subscribe while you're there. It's not even worth reminding you to say it anymore. Sure, save me the effort. And the argument. Yes, all of this makes wool hard to wash in many ways, but wool garments don't actually need washing as much as the cotton or synthetic ones we're used to. Body odor simply don't stay in wool as much as they do in other materials. When I did my video on medieval laundry methods two years ago, I surveyed my friends on how often they needed to wash their wool socks and got answers ranging from I buy superwash wool and clean it in the machine to they never ever get smelly. I only wash them if there is literal dirt. The average time to smelliness was two or three days of wear for people whose cotton or synthetic socks smelled gross at the end of one day. I have a growing collection of tall historical style wool stockings, as well as modern wool socks, and I've found a brief soak with wool wash like Eucalan every couple weeks is enough to get them plenty clean. And historically, the only wool item one would wear next to the skin was their socks. Wool can be woven quite fine and soft, especially with historical methods, but not quite as soft as linen or cotton. So through centuries of Western fashion, the usual practice was to wear a layer of plant fibers like linen or cotton that could be easily laundered under your wool outer garments. The wool then usually only needed spot cleaning. My wool dresses and jackets rarely need more than a bit of alcohol-based linen spray in the underarms, and I give them a cold water soak with Eucaland once a year on principle. Occasionally, I'll need to spot clean some literal dirt out of my skirt hems, but the skirts especially never touch my skin, so they'll never get dirty from being on my body. Bold of you to say thigh-high socks aren't dirty. We are talking about staying warm, not about being hot. Ugh. Look, what you do with your tall stockings is your business. I'm just trying not to get demonetized here. Part of why the skirts especially rarely need cleaning is I wear them with petticoats. This isn't just to keep them clean or because it's more comfortable or because it looks better, though all of these are true. Petticoats can keep you so much warmer than a skirt on its own, even a wool one. Insulation isn't just about the thickness of the fiber that you're wearing, it's also about the trapped air between you and the cold outside. So wearing even a lightweight cotton petticoat like this one under a long skirt makes it considerably warmer. For Bay Area winters, I find one cotton or linen petticoat under a wool skirt is plenty, and it's literally like wearing bed sheets and a blanket over them. But you can make petticoats in just about any material you like, and fashion history will have your back. Fun prints? Heck yes. Go get yourself a quintic cotton with llamas printed on it if you like. Flannel petticoats are a classic, both cotton flannel and wool flannel, though I would recommend wearing wool flannel over a lighter cotton or linen layer. If you need serious insulation, remember that quilted petticoats were super popular in the 18th century, both for the shape they gave under a skirt and for how warm they were. Heck, we even have 19th century insulated petticoats that are basically a down comforter you can tie around your waist. You can make them as plain or as decorative as you like too. Lace is a classic for lighter weights, and I have a linen petticoat with lace insertion in place of the seams that always makes me feel fancy. But my others are super plain with no decoration at all, and that's fine too. I do usually put a ruffle at the bottom of any shaped petticoat, and it's not just decorative. It helps keep the skirt in the correct shape. And as I discovered when I spent three days walking around New York City in a reproduction 1881 dress that my great great grandmother could have worn, the ruffle actually makes the skirt length less of a tripping hazard. It didn't get caught under my feet once. You can make a petticoat out of just about any skirt pattern, including the super simple ones that barely need a pattern. 18th century or earlier petticoats are often just rectangles of fabric pleated to a waistband with openings at either side to tie them on. Mid 19th century ones could be pleated or gathered with one opening at the side or back. As skirts became more and more shaped in the late 1860s and early 1870s, petticoats did too. 
if you have a skirt pattern, you can use it to make a petticoat. My 1881 petticoat is actually my skirt pattern mock-up and is identical except it has a drawstring waist in the back rather than a pleated one. It's a tiny bit shorter and the ruffle is wider. My 1890s and 1900s walking skirt petticoats are even simpler. My pattern is five pieces, a center front, two side gores, and two back gores. I cut the front and side pieces off below the knee and just used rectangles in place of the back pieces with the same drawstring waist. Then I attach a wide double layered ruffle to the bottom edge to make it ankle length. The shapes are all super simple and it gives a great line under both 1890s walking skirts with an A-line silhouette and the more trumpet shaped 1900 styles too. I'm partial to full length skirts in winter, but if you prefer a different length, you can make a petticoat the same way and it will still keep you warm under the skirt. Knee length might be enough for you, especially if you wear wool stockings or fleece tights or tall boots. Just make your petticoat very slightly shorter than your skirt length, half an inch or so. So it doesn't poke out under the skirt hem. So remember that 19th century down comforter petticoat? Well, that is far from the only instance of someone getting out of bed and going, screw this, I'm just gonna wear my blanket as clothes. Cultures across the entire world have had wearable blankets going as far back as I know of, basically. Ponchos, South Asian shawls, medieval European cloaks, and even the ancestor of the kilt are all ways of turning a simple rectangular piece of warm fabric into something you can wear on your body. If your culture has a wearable blanket garment, tell us about it in the comments. Methods for wearing these sorts of garments varied and could be as simple as wrap it around yourself and maybe use a pin if you need, to cut a hole and stick your head through, to the pleating and belting of the Scottish great kilt or belted plaid that allowed a person to wear nine yards of heavy fulled wool. The nine yards refers to nine yards of historical width fabric, which was between 24 and 36 inches wide. So the great kilt was made by cutting that length in half and sewing two long edges together. Using modern 60 inch wide fabric, it would be four and a half yards. But anyways, just wrapping yourself in a blanket as outerwear is a time honored tradition in fashion history. And it's both simple and extremely effective. Then why are you letting her tell me to get dressed? Because you were complaining. Stay there under your blanket if you like. Just don't take that one outside unless you're doing the laundry. A lot of these blanket style cloaks were just rectangles of various shapes and sizes, but my day-to-day -day winter cloak is just a tiny bit more complicated. It's not historically accurate to any specific time or place, but it does look good with a huge variety of styles from medieval to Victorian, Edwardian, and even 20th century. I started with a square of 60 inch wide wool coating and then pieced some narrower cotton flannel to make a softer lining layer for the inside. Then I marked the center of the square and cut a slit from the center straight out to one of the sides. You could do the slit from the center to a corner. It'll just give you a slightly different shape. The slit is rounded slightly to make a comfortable shape for the neck. And then I simply bag lined it by sewing around all the edges and leaving a small gap to turn it out. Most of the time I wear it with a medieval-ish iron penangular cloak pin, although the leaf decorations on this are decidedly more Lothlorien than documentably medieval. We do love our historical fantasy in this house. To avoid damaging the fabric, I've hand sewn eyelets to put the pin through with wool yarn, but I can still wear it without the pin for a different look. It actually looks incredibly old Hollywood that way, especially if I'm wearing an evening gown somewhere. I'll put a pattern diagram up on my Patreon if you want to make one yourself. It's a very simple and quick project that I've gotten a ton of use out of. So let me show you my go-to history bounding look for braving the chill and damp of Bay Area winter. I'm starting in modern undergarments, a long sleeved cotton t-shirt, and for the sake of filming, these black shorts. Depending on how cold it is, I'll wear either modern wool socks, thanks Catherine for keeping me well supplied with the good ones from UK Costco, or taller historical style ones. The tall ones usually need garters of some kind to stay up. And I have these ones made from a tablet weaving project that was supposed to be a belt, but I ended up not liking for that. I'm also considering making or buying a garter belt since I really like the garter clips on my 1900s corset. Over this, I'll wear a walking skirt petticoat, whichever one I feel like, depending on the day. If I want the skirt to look especially dramatic, I have a stiff cotton organdy one, and I'll sometimes double up and wear a plain cotton or linen petticoat under it, since it's a pain to wash and restarch. 
The next layer is a wool skirt. I have a few different ones, ranging from a tropical weight so light I had to line it with cotton muslin, to this one, a heavy wool flannel. Sometimes I'll add something on my top half too, could be a sweater, a vest, or even this adorable tailored Eaton jacket. Finally, on goes the cloak. Since it's pinned, I don't have to worry about it coming unwrapped as I move around. My typical winter shoes are 1890s reproduction boots from Joe Bear, who I cannot recommend highly enough. I could even add vintage gloves and a hat if I wanted, although I usually skip the gloves because they make me clumsy. Here I am, all layered up and looking very old timey. This outfit will keep me warm and damp cold down to the high 40s Fahrenheit in the Bay Area, depending on the wind. In my visits back to places that get colder, I found high 40s in the Bay Area requires me to dress as warmly as I would for the high 20s in dry cold, somewhere like Minnesota. If I needed to, I could layer up even more. Heavier petticoats and more of them, a silk base layer in place of a cotton t-shirt, a jacket with more coverage than the ones I have, and a cloak lined with something warmer than cotton flannel add insulated gloves because I would prefer to be clumsy and not be frostbitten. I want to hear about your favorite historical winter wear. Tell me about it in the comments and don't forget to tell YouTube you liked what you saw while you're there. Subscribe for a regular dose of fashion history sass and check out the Snappy Dragon Patreon for source notes, pattern diagrams, and access to the channel's new Discord server. I have plenty more offerings for you on this chilly winter day, so click here if you're not sick of listening to me yet. And if you want to sleep as warm and cozy as I am dressed, Brooklinen is offering my viewers a special discount of $20 off any order over $100. Click the link below and use code SNAPPYDRAGON20. Stay warm, friends. I'm gonna go make hot chocolate. Me too? Yes, fine. But you can do the dishes after.